and thank you. Well, thanks so much, Hope and Chuck, for having me here. I really appreciate it. And I'm so looking forward to us talking about unraveling the cosmic mystery of all of these experiences that we have. So for today, I'm going to share details I've probably never shared before. I'm gonna share with you my conclusions based on all the various disciplines of research that I have been looking into over the past several decades. And most importantly, talk about how do we bridge that into our daily lives. Uh, it was really inspiring for me when, and very validating when I was watching the Surviving Death series that probably a lot of you have seen. And there was one woman whose loved one had passed. And I remember her saying, only quantum physics helps my grief. And it really, really struck me at how many people need science to help them make sense of the experiences that many of us here today have had. Furthermore, when we hear that how much, uh, how much greater it is about who we are than we could have ever imagined, it just gives me chills. Feel free to take down any notes as I'm going along so that we can talk about your questions and have some lively discussion at the end. And I'm hoping at the end, you too will feel inspired to share some spiritually transformative experiences and you know, maybe even how some of what I've shared today has been helpful for you. And lastly, just as a PS note, the, um, this past conference at IANS, it turned out that a major piece, basically a highlight of what we're talking about today, didn't make it into the video and then the slides didn't. So the whole rest of the presentation didn't make sense. So we've just re-recorded that and hopefully they'll be putting that um, back on screen. So, so where we're headed today, um, as, as Chuck and Hope said, you know, I've had experiences since I was young and then I went on my own journey over the decades to find the answers. And I've had many different kinds of spiritual communications, what I feel like. Um, but for me, it was like, well, how do we explain these supposedly impossible events? And are there actually many worldly or spiritual realms like we've been taught? Are they equally real? And what is real anyway? So many of us in our experiences hear about light and love. And I wanted to know, what does science say about that? And lastly, how does energy and consciousness interface with matter and our body? So from childhood, I always experienced presence in the space. That's the, the best way I can say it. It definitely felt very thick with beingness and love and relationship. And it definitely was constantly in communication with me through various chills and intuitions and downloads. And um, I just took it for granted that everybody felt the same way. As a third and fourth grader, I was raised Catholic. So I just assumed presence was Jesus or God or angels. And so for me, I would just chat along. So for me, I might be chatting with Jesus if I felt like I needed to talk to a brother figure. Um, might be talking to angels if I felt like I just need a peer group. And uh, maybe God, if I felt like I needed to go to the head honcho, so to speak. And in those young days, I had my little sacred space. I had a little toy piano that I made an altar out of, had my little rosaries and first communion holy books on it. And it just felt sacred for me. During mass, I would always see the dancing colors behind the priest speaking. I just assumed everybody could see that. I remember in those days, just assuming I would be a nun. And then in the fourth grade, I'm gonna tell you something that happened that really made me start wondering about what later we, I would know would be called physics. So in the fourth grade, we were living in Puerto Rico and um, a friend of mine, uh, their family wanted to fly from Ponce to San Juan for the day for some business. And so uh, I went with my friend with them. And I used to then always wear this little cross necklace and it 
it really felt like my connection to presence. And I never really took it off. And when I got there, we were going to go to the beach. So the woman who was watching us, she just really, really kept bugging me about taking it off so I wouldn't lose, lose it in the ocean. So I did. And then, of course, I got home. I did not have the cross. And I was really distraught. And I remember, um, you know, hurrying up and asking them, can you check? Can you have the woman check? Uh, no, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't see anything. You must have just lost it. Um, and I was distraught. It felt like weeks. It might have been months. It felt like months. But um, within at least a few weeks, next thing I know, I come home from school and my cross necklace is in the middle of my dresser, which I get choked up thinking about. And of course, I ran to my mom thinking, oh, good, they finally found it and someone put it on my dresser. But nobody knew what I was talking about. My mother had no idea what, what I was talking about. And my mom's very conventional. They don't play jokes like that. And I just remember being wildered, bewildered and wondering how on earth. But I just went around thanking the, my angels for finding my cross and giving it back to me. And then I went about my day. By the sixth grade, um, I really had the spiritual download that set me on this path because um, I had been to science class that morning and that evening I was basically on my bed doing my science homework. And I was thinking about these atoms that I had been taught about. And we were, you know, they were kind of described as these little circles in space. And I kept wondering, well, if everything's just circles in space, I don't really see a boundary. So how does that little atom in space know that it's part of the chair and how does that other little atom next to it know that it's part of my butt on the chair and then boom you know in came this huge spiritual download that really set me on the path to finding answers through physics so as i got older and throughout life you know, experiences have continued. A lot of spiritual communications, as I said, through intuitions or visions or um, meditative experiences, a lot through dreams. Uh, some of them felt like past life experiences. Others would have seemed like a past life, but for some reason, I didn't really feel like it was a past life. I thought it almost felt like it was being given an experience of someone else's life as a Kind of an answer to a question. So for example, on an odd past life dream, I remember waking up one morning feeling like, um, well, I woke up, but in the dream, I had been this French man in 18th century France. But in that dream, I had just awakened from remembering a past life as Cornelius Valerius, which I never knew that name. It, it was almost as if, imagine you see a name written on a file. And it was kind of like that. I, I saw this vivid name. So when I got up the next morning and was really pondering these dreams, I Googled Cornelius Valerius because of course the name struck me. I'm Valerie, that's a Valerius. And I was shocked to find out that he really had been an, um, a Dutch humanist way back when and had basically his career was very similar to my passions today. So those are things that, you know, just kind of make you wonder how, what's happening here. Um, some of the other experiences were maybe around Christ or early Christianity, for example. Uh, I remember going into a meditation. Ironically enough, I was in the process of trying to write what became my first book, Living in the Quantum Reality. Uh, but I was really struggling with getting it out, so to speak. I was really struggling with the writing. And so I, I innocently just asked that question. But for some reason, I was thrown into a vision where I looked down and I saw my body as a skinny you know, man. And I noticed like, oh my gosh, my feet are nailed to a cross and um, my hands were outstretched. But then I looked to my left and um, it's emotional even today, but 
uh, there was Christ and I was overcome with the divine love, as I know all of you probably have experienced, and, um, and bathing in that. But then my attention was directed to some boulders and I seemed to be shown kind of where Christ um, was buried. My vision was then directed off to the right and I saw a man that seemed to me was St. Paul. And then I began to experience all these very visceral experiences um, that later I went and Googled about St. Paul. Quite frankly, I didn't in those days know much about St. Paul because um, I didn't really like the guy, actually. I, I kind of preferred some of the other apostles, if you will. But um, I learned more about him. And what I realized, I had actually had a lot of visceral experiences of his life, like stonings. And, you know, I remember when all of a sudden I felt like I was choking and then I found out he had been beheaded and, and what have you. So these things leave you wondering, like, what's going on here? Uh, I've, I've had pre-death and after-death communications. I remember like my grandmother that I adored coming to me, what turned out to be about 30 days before her passing. And it was so vivid and so real. And she was letting me know she would be going soon, but it was almost like we were having a tea party. It was so joyful. It was just wonderful. And then of course she did pass. So I knew at least I had gotten to say goodbye to her. Um, when my mom recently passed, uh, in about a week, my father seemed to come to me in a dream, letting me know that, you know, he had mom and things were okay. Um, some of these dreams can be very confusing because in some, I feel like I'm me and it feels like this life history, but in others, it feels like I'm very different people and I know different languages and I know different, um, uh, I have different memories, like a different history altogether. So, you know, that can be very, very confusing. Uh, some of these experiences, again, will be answers to questions. I remember when I'd really been studying energy a lot, and then I had been comparing it with what I had learned esoterically um, about the way the energies are connected, like, you know, the seven chakras and all kinds of things. And anyway, I was really contemplating, well, how does, how does this all fit together? And how does it fit together with the science that I know? And then I remember waking up about three in the morning and it was so vividly clear. I knew the answer to that question. I could see and feel the way all the energies were lined up. And I had the thought, well, I should go write this down. And then, of course, you're like, ah, it's three in the morning. I'll go back to bed. I, I'm remembering this like I'm remembering my own name. And so, of course, I go back to bed. And, of course, I wake up. And it was very clear that when you're in one state of consciousness, you know, you have certain clarity. But then when you go into another state, it, it's very different. Uh, Orbs, I'm going to show you some orb pictures today just because it's fun. That picture in the upper right hand corner happens to be just a picture my husband innocently took of me while we were living in Denver, where my private practice was. We were just at a, a French uh, creperie. And when I looked at it more closely, I noticed this thing. And I'm like, what is that? And I'll show you a close up view of that. And no, it wasn't the tablecloth. Uh, but anyway, different spiritual healings, including being able to heal some like basal carcinoma on my forehead and, and um, just all kinds of experiences. Uh, in the upper right is a picture, one of the first curious orb pictures that I had. I had just landed in France that morning for a visit with friends. And... Um, we literally had just gotten over about six in the morning from the airport. The hotel lobby had some croissants and what have you that we were partaking of. And we were just taking a, a picture. And then I noticed this blob on the side. And when I blew it up, the picture underneath that is what it looked like. And I don't know how it's coming across on your end of the screen. But when I was looking in my photos, I'm like, oh, my gosh, that looks like a face. And then I'm like, wow, that almost looks like eyes and glasses. And I thought, hey, I wonder if Graham came to me to, with France. So I kind of laughed and I got great joy out of that. On the bottom is the close-up of that orb, if you will, that ended up 
um, in the picture of the crapery. I have never since, of all the orb books I've looked at, I've never seen anything like that. If anybody has more information on that, I would love to hear it. But uh, that was such a fascinating uh, manifestation for me to see there, that orb. Um, anyway, healing uh, and different spiritual experiences had uh, continued throughout life. <clears throat> um, I remember about 30 days before dad had passed, uh, I had called from Denver and he was in Florida and the phones were messing up. So mom would have to hold the phone and I could hear him kind of um, shout out from his ICU bed, tell Val I now know what she means about the other life. Well, my whole life I had been called weird and wacko and all those kinds of things by my folks and, and people. I never really met anybody in my personal life that had these same worldviews or experiences that I had. And so for my father to say that, I was like, wow. And so later on, when I was able to ask him about it, he's like, yeah, I hadn't even gone under anesthesia yet. And all of a sudden I was plummeted into this other body and it seemed like, you know, present day. I seemed to be me, but I was in an apartment in New Orleans and I, I can see the walls, I can see the pictures and what have you. And it really mystified him. We all know about, um, you know, a lot of these common experiences that people have before death, right? That kind of hint to us about other realms. Well, I did happen to be um, had flown in the night before, had no idea dad was going to pass the next morning, but he did. But later on, about three in the morning, he was like, I have to go somewhere. I have to go somewhere. Well, where do you have to go, dad? I don't know, but I have to go somewhere. And then he was gone by about six in the morning. Before mom recently passed, you know, in the months preceding, she could see people. She would tell me she hears people's voices. Um, when she actually passed and I found her on a Saturday evening. Um, she was in the bedroom. We had a hospital bed there. And I found her with our, you know, her arms were grasping the, the, um, basically the, the handrails and she had drawn her knees up to her hips and her feet were pointing out to the right side of the bed as if she was trying to lift herself as if she had been called to come and she was ready to go. And her face was in such a state of wonder. And the reason that these things um, were meaningful is because first off, I tried that morning to even get her to be able to hold her legs up for me for a little bit and she couldn't, they would just flop. And then second of all, mom had always really been afraid to go. I could tell she went to mass and was a practicing Catholic, but at the same time, I could tell she didn't really believe and so to find her in such a state of wonder, her eyes were open like saucers. Her mouth was in like the O oh of a chorus voice and just this O oh of wonder. And it was such a blessing. It was probably the biggest gift she ever gave me because I knew she had been greeted. Now my clients and other people have had lots of interesting experiences too, whether they were able to heal their own breast cancer. <clears throat> One client that you would say, no, this, this gal is this great gal. She's completely normal, but she kept getting messages from the Pleiades. I had another client that in the middle of session, next thing you know, um, a, she was in a trans medium situation and whoever was coming through was trying to talk to me. And then I'm trying to say, wait a minute, this isn't my session. This is her session. <clears throat> a lot of you know people who have had what I call 360 degree consciousness. It's where they feel like um, they're themselves, but they're everybody else too, but they're also every drop. And we're gonna talk about that, how that might be possible. And it has to do with holographic um, theory. Um, the crop circle situation is also interesting because it shows that communication with something else uh, Freddie Silva, I first saw him speak at the Subtle Energy Conference I seen, and um, he was doing all kinds of crop circle research, and he was talking about how the scientists that he was working with would have all kinds of questions, you know, scientific questions that they were pondering. They were still trying to find answers, and then he would notice the synchronicity that certain crop circles 
would appear that they ended up realizing were actually these answers in symbol form to the scientific questions that they would answer. And then they would follow up with another question and they would get, you know, get another crop circle that was another answer. So all these fascinating things that we're all experiencing. <clears throat> Dolores Cannon books are exciting for many of you who want to know about a lot of experiences. Um, she's a hypnotherapist and a lot of worlds, you know, clients having different worlds experiences that would come out. It was just fascinating. So obviously all of these things constantly made me turn to the literature, you know, throughout all the ancient wisdom, all different kinds of religions, consciousness studies, quantum physics, different science. And I wanted to know well, what does the science say, especially about energy and light and spiritual realities, about mind and consciousness, body and matter. God is light and love, like we had been taught. What is the reality of that? So who are we if all of these things are true? And what is the relationship among all of this? <clears throat> so this slide is busy, forgive it. But I'm going to just right here introduce you to several concepts that will pop up as I'm going along in different kinds of experiences so that you can kind of see in a nutshell uh, the most exciting things. And, um, and uh, so for example, number one, matter, no matter how far they went looking for the building blocks, they found out it was really made of energy, it's really made of light, and it's actually mostly made of space. Again, we'll talk more about it later. We are made of light and light itself has a dual nature they have found out. So we all have this wave nature where it's the energy frequencies that are spreading out. Um, they can resonate and entrain with one another. We'll talk about the significance of that and how it leads us to experience a oneness. Uh, it also has that particle nature. So the way we experience our body is being a particle. Light does have that dual nature. We are made of that light. We do have scientifically that nature. There's also a concept about coherent energy because when you get energy really resonating together and it becomes really tightly organized like a, um, like a laser light, it has huge effects in creating material reality. So we're gonna talk um, a little bit more about that. Uh, science also talks about how consciousness creates material reality. You actually have quantum physicists that, are, that have concluded that based on their data. And there's another interesting thing that has to do with consciousness because they find out in physics, when you change the energy pattern, that wave spectrum that underlies form, you actually change the form. And so that can happen when we shift states of consciousness. You find out some people will, um, you know, their physical face might change uh, in a trans medium type of situation. Uh, the second big uh, stream of information is about how effects are local and non-local. And what that really means is when you're thinking of regular light, which is electromagnetic light, it actually takes time and space to travel which is why in regular physics, people have called us crazy for having these experiences or ESPs or intuitions or anything, because they're gonna say, but wait a minute, it's impossible because light takes time and space to travel. You can't have instantaneous effects and you can't have effects at huge distances, except for you can. So whenever you've heard the phrase spooky action at a distance, that was Einstein who kept referring to what now is called non-local energy, non-local effects. Now, when you hear the word quantum, basically know that what we end up referring to are these non-local instantaneous communications where everything is all now and it's all one collective. And indeed, entanglement has been proven where, for instance, they'll take two photons, um, let's say that we're born together, they're going to go stick one in London, and they're going to stick the other one in California, and they're going to tickle the one in London, but the one in California moves exactly at the same time as its sister particle did in London, and they call it these, these 
these particles are now forever entangled and they, they are like one entity. They are not separate, even though there's great distances. Uh, the other um, great concept is the holographic nature of the universe that David Bohm had talked about and others that we'll, I'll introduce to you. But the key nature of the word holographic and why it's so important for us who have had these experiences is this. Within each part lies the information for the whole. Now, remember, these are physicists who are saying this. We are the part and we are part of the whole. And even physicists are saying within each of us as a part and within each of our atoms, for example, resides the information for the whole. That is powerful. And lastly, how do we direct consciousness? I've definitely noticed a theme between attention and will guides the consciousness. It gives it a direction. And the motivation and love qualifies it. It gives it a quality. It gives it a fuel on the uh, experience. So <clears throat> science definitely tells us there are many more worlds than meet the eye. Some of you may have heard of NASA's James Webb Telescope. And essentially, if you were to take a grain of sand and you were to hold it up to a night sky where it's complete blackness, that's what the James Webb Telescope view that you're looking at that's what it's showing us. There are thousands of galaxies in that little speck of space. And um, I mentioned at the IANS conference um, that we recently had that if you look closely, you can start seeing the swirling together of, um, of those galaxies. And I, I talk about there more about its significance. Now, Science says there really are many realities. Even in classical physics, not even quantum, but even in classical physics, they're starting to have theories that say ours is one of a very large number of other classical worlds. Now in quantum physics, it's called the many worlds interpretation and it's attributed to Everett. But basically they'll say, well, there's these parallel realities and they're in superposition. And that simply means that ours is part of this larger reality where all that can exist does. Now, you guys and I might not really agree with the way he's seeing things, but that's okay, it doesn't matter. The way he sees it is that we are here in this reality and we're an observer that actually causes, um, we make a choice here and, and we live this life, but every choice we didn't take we now have versions of ourselves in other branching off parallel realities where all those choices we didn't take are taken there. Even in classical quantum physics, what does it say about these many layers to reality? Well, we do have this spectrum of energy frequencies and the visible portion is only about 0.0035%. That's pretty small. And I remember as a young child thinking, well, why does everybody get so hung up on, on science and only what we can see and what have you when it's such a speck of what's out there? Now, today, science has admitted they only know about 4% of the universe and the rest they don't know, but they can detect that something's going on. So they call it dark energy and dark matter. That's basically what that talks about if you start hearing about it. They do agree we are fields within fields and we are waves within waves and all interacting. So speaking of interacting, just on Tuesday, synchronistically, NASA's James Webb Telescope caught this fingerprint in space where these were two stars passing one another and look at that beautiful fingerprint that is what it looks like when the waves are merging. That is your spectral nature. That is your frequency nature as well. Just beautiful. So I'm gonna take a slight tangent to emphasize something about waves because the three words, resonance, entrainment, and coherence are huge. 
So when we have waves resonating, basically they're like dolphins and they're swimming up and down. Well, when they're in sync, they're resonating. Waves are resonating. And here's why that's so important. When they start resonating, they start in training. And what does that mean? It means that, wow, my wave over here and your wave over here are starting to have a mutual vibratory effect on one another. We're influencing one another's wave nature, literally. We become like one collective. So in my view of things, if we have, let's say, ESP with someone, we truly are on the same wavelength. Like somehow our consciousness has been pointed towards theirs. And there's such resonance and entrainment happening that we do become like one mind. And coherence, it becomes so tightly organized like a laser that it has powerful effects that we'll talk about later. But resonance, entrainment, and coherence, three great concepts for us to understand. Now, a little bit more about our nature of light. Science has confirmed we are made of light. And like I mentioned, it's a dual nature. So we've got our particle nature like our body. We've got our wave nature going on, like our consciousness, essentially. And in that light, you'll notice on the hand, you'll see a rainbow. Because the white light is when all, you know, when we're not seeing it split up into its different frequency bands. But when you see the rainbow, you're actually seeing it in its different frequency bands with the red going the slowest oscillation, like that up and down oscillating is the slowest. And the violet is the fastest. Each note that you hear is a different frequency band. Now, interestingly enough about particles, some physicists are even arguing that no particles actually exist because when you really get closer, what they really seem to be is like just a bundle of light energy that create like a bump on a graph because of resonance. So the photon itself, which is this quanta of, of light, it is thought to um, be at many different frequency bandwidths, and it's thought to mediate the consciousness, like our personal consciousness with the consciousness of all. The role of light photon is thought to mediate consciousness. And then there might be other light as well, but that's not as clear quite yet. So how did they find out about light's nature? You probably might have heard about the double slit experiments. I'm going to keep it very simple today. And I'm going to say, basically, imagine that you are shining a light through a piece of paper in which you've made two slits. And you're wondering what, the, um, what it's going to look like on the wall behind this paper. Well, essentially, if it's a wave, you see that waveform just like we saw with the stars and now you're seeing at the bottom there. When you, when you see a waveform, you, you, you expect a certain pattern that's gonna be spread out. And um, what they found was, oh, and if it's a particle, you're just gonna expect to see more of a dot. So the interesting thing was, is over and over and over again, it would be a wave until we humans would measure or observe it. And only then, would it be a particle? And believe me, the scientists tried to find all kinds of ways to trick the photons or the subatomic particle, but it was consistent that it's our acts of measurement that are changing it into a particle. And they found out that it even works backward in times as well. So that's why so many quantum physicists have concluded human consciousness really does manifest objective reality. And so many of them say consciousness is the fundamental reality. There is no thing. Now, what about our messages and our experiences about love? What is the role of love in manifesting reality? I found it quite fascinating in Treatise on Cosmic Fire, an esoteric book, that it said love is the force which produces coherency. Wow, think about that. So if coherency is that powerful laser-like 
energy that has effects. Love is the force which produces coherency. It seems like the quality of our consciousness really does matter. Now, in energy healing experiments, we find that more energy healing happens when the healer goes into coherent higher states of love. And in quantum biology, they find that when all of our organs are on the same wavelength, the rhythms are matched up, they're, they're resonating, they're in sync, we have this coherent energy in our body and it's aligned with health. And when they look at the nature of energy when we're in disease states, it's very chaotic and definitely, you know, you know, we, we feel disorganized and chaotic because our energies truly are. So what we're finding is it's subjectivity that manifests objectivity. We can call it love manifesting light. We can say it's consciousness that is creating material electromagnetic reality. We can say it's the energy or the geometry of space that's manifesting form. Now, there's an interesting thing about the geometry of space. Um, who knew that, um, for instance, I guess it's called gauge symmetry on how they measure space in physics. And you and I really don't care what gauge symmetry is. But it's interesting to know that they can measure the difference. So when uh, William Tiller, a Stanford material scientist, started doing intention experiments, for instance, trying to change the pH of water uh, or other kinds of things, they noticed that um, it would change the gauge symmetry of the space. Furthermore, he started calling something conditioned space when, um, for instance, the room where the experiments would be held, he noticed that when the experiment finished, it would still, it would still have effects. And he realized that the gauge symmetry of the space had changed. And um, so it was of interest for me when I would be in my office. And before I knew about this, a lot of people would walk into my office and they would say, Val, I don't know what it is about your office. I walk in, I start feeling tingles, electricity, feels like I'm borrowing your energy to do different states here. And I didn't know what to say in those days. Oh, okay, that's interesting. And then later on, when I found out about conditioned space that Tiller had taught us about, I was like, oh, okay, that's what's going on. I have such higher consciousness clients coming into my office and we get deep in all kinds of great conversations. We literally have conditioned the space of the office. So it's fascinating to know that really, um, really does happen. So um, in psychology, we know that Stress definitely has effects on the brain body uh, as if it's real. And, and in the imagination, when we do meditations or we're in imagining, like if, we're, if we keep imagining tigers coming after us, you know, our brain doesn't know much the difference between if that's actually a real tiger and if it's just an imagined tiger. It acts about the same. So it's just interesting to start realizing the realness of this, all of this. Um, and again, coherent love energy, uh, you know, has been linked to physical healing, um, if you will. So again, we move in consciousness through the will and our intention and the love and motivation energy seems to give it like the fuel. So there's a lot of research on out of body, as you guys probably know a lot more about. Uh, they've even studied monks and mystics and meditations and, and, you know, verified certain bilocations when not only Christ, but other mystics would be known to, you know, be in more than one place at a time. We talked about the energy healing a type of thing. You know, you direct your healing, uh, you direct your attention to the place of your healing, whether it's locally in your own body or someone else's body, or even if it's non-local healing. In these remote viewing experiments, it's um, pretty fascinating because um, even the U.S. government had what was called Project Stargate, and the military even noticed that you can teach people to remote view. Now, what is remote viewing? 
So imagine that you're sitting in a military base and you're really good at it and someone's making you do some remote viewing experiments and they give you a target. They don't tell you what it is, but you're supposed to draw what you see. So it's kind of like an ESP situation, but you are given a target. So you don't know where on the planet it is or even if it's off planet, but you're, you're drawing what's coming to you. Well, they have found that there's some people that are really, really, really good at this. And they've even been able to draw uh, is I forget now. I'm just going to say, let's say it was a ballistic missile or something. It seemed like it was some military thing and nobody knew what the inside of this mechanical device was. Nobody knew what it looked like except for the designer. And yet the remote viewer was able to draw it really accurately. So just a lot of fascinating things about projecting our consciousness in other places. Claude Swanson is an MIT physicist who did a lot of research about what is it about non-local energies that are related to precognitions and ESP and, um, and the way we direct our consciousness. In the field of psychology or neuroscience, you know, neuroplasticity is probably a, a phrase I use with my clients regularly. It's so important because that's the basis of our habits. Uh, it's the basis of our instincts and it's the basis of our muscle memory. So anything we do repeatedly, our neurons are so intelligent that they go around constantly rewiring to anything that we're doing repeatedly. And more than that, our body is so intelligent that when something's not getting used, it's as if the universe says, ah, you're not using it. I'm going to make really great, efficient use of this energy somewhere else. And literally the dendrites of the neurons start shriveling up. They often call it experience dependent plasticity. I often say, I think this is really the process of biological evolution and evolution is happening with every thought we think. Epigenetics is another fascinating um, uh, discipline. When I was younger, all we ever heard about was genetics and how we're a victim of our genes. So thank God literally for Bruce Lipton and others who discovered that, no, wait a minute, it's the role of mind. It's how our mind is responding to the environment that basically is responsible for turning on or off the gene expression. And furthermore, we know in trauma research that if we don't have healing, we will pass trauma genes down seven generations. But at the same time, uh, if we get healing, our genes change in response to the healing. And then when we have children, our children receive our new genes. So again, look at the role of mind in biological evolution. In transpersonal psychology, we notice that you can shift your consciousness at will. Again, it's about directed attention and the quality of love definitely influences your experience. In reincarnation um, and NDE research, which you guys are more familiar with, uh, it kind of is bad news for anybody contemplating suicide, which is so sadly thought about so much today because it does seem wherever we are in consciousness before we transition to the other side is exactly where we are on the other side. Like it doesn't solve anything. Now there is some mixed um, research about the role of belief and experience because um, essentially in most of the NDE research, you know, you're gonna have an NDE experience even if you're an atheist. But at the same time, apparently belief does play some kind of a role in your afterlife experience. Now, William Bray was a physicist, a neurochemist, and he had over 30 medically documented deaths. And what he noticed, I guess he was there so often that he kind of became like an experimenter on the other side. And he, and he started, basically he says, you know what? It seemed like, oh, there were the Catholics, you know, there were the Jews over in that section, and there were the Muslims in that section. And the way it seemed to him is that their belief structure believed that the afterlife would look a certain way. And so for them, it did. 
and he wondered about hell. So he said he decided to go visit hell a few times. And it wasn't about hellfire and damnation. He said it was kind of more of a dystopian, you know, gray and really negative moods and energies, if you will. Uh, but he said nobody was even interacting with him there. It just seemed to be a really dull place, but apparently he found it fascinating. Now, many of you are familiar with Eben Alexander and Proof of Heaven. And it really struck me when I read his book that he too noticed that when the thought shifted, then he went to a different place. So when bacteria was first eating his brain, uh, he was thrust into an earthworm experience where it was more sensory, if you will. But then after whatever time passed and there was room for a thought to bubble up, then next thing you know, he's like, oh, I wonder if there's somewhere else. And then he was in Gateway Valley, which he described as very earth-like with vivid colors and landscapes and what have you. So it does seem interesting to learn how do we shift and move our consciousness at will. Now, um, we have these different experiences of time. So what does science say about time? <clears throat> Basically, Einstein concluded that time is relative to the preference frame of the observer. Well, that really means that where they are in their position or motion um, makes a difference. So in the upper left corner, there is a picture of a um, train platform because Einstein, when he started thinking about time, in those days, time and space were considered absolutes. They didn't change. But he started thinking about you know, being at a train station and he said, I wonder if the people who are on the platform view time and light differently than the people who are on the train. And indeed, he confirmed that they did. Uh, he came up with his general relativity theory. It's been confirmed over and over and over again. Um, but here's the cool thing for us. So um, if we're on Earth in an area of strong gravity, then we're going to see our clocks run normal. But tops of a mountain, uh, we're going to see them running a little faster. In space, we're going to see them running faster. Now, the person in space is going to see their clocks running normal. But when they talk to us, it's going to seem like our clocks are running slow. So when we have these accidents and we're thrust into to slow time, which I know happened to me and many of you, uh, when we're having these dreams and NDEs where years pass by, clearly time is, is running way faster. And it's kind of fascinating that um, Einstein had noticed that there's some connection with gravity and connection with mass. And he says, it's mass and gravity that actually warps time and space. And I won't get into the details of the tangents that that went into, but what we do know is that we all have these gravitational fields, no matter how subatomically small we are or how large we are like Earth or a sun. But all mass bodies affect all others. So we do indeed, we're constantly in interaction with all that is. And I had always wondered if gravity was related to consciousness. So over the past couple of decades, I've been trying to read all kinds of things about gravity to clue me in. And I specifically found it interesting when Roger Penrose, who is a physicist, and Stuart Hameroff, who is an anesthesiologist, actually came up with a theory of consciousness that involves a role of gravity. I believe we have enough science to say we are already immortal. Death is an illusion, especially thanks to ions, right? <laughs> We've, we have plenty of research about near death and shared death experiences and communications and out-of-body experiences and past lives and reincarnation. Like we have so much research. Now, as a therapist, I always found Ian Stevenson's work on past life and reincarnation particularly helpful because there are sometimes in session where these phobias are just really unexplained. And then when a client ends up doing some kind of hypnotherapy work, they find out that, oh, well, hey, that's how I died in a past life. And he linked a lot of our birthmarks to the way we died in a past life. What about, what does science say about our interconnectedness and communication with these other realms? I do believe there's enough support to say yes. 
they say multiple realities exist. Well, all righty then. They say the universe is holographic and within each part lies the information for the whole. Well, that certainly tells me that I might be able to pick up information from somewhere else, no matter the distance. This non-local spooky action of distance, this entanglement, it's been proven. And how does it connect to our bodies? Well, they've actually shown quantum entanglement within our neurons, within the microtubules of the neurons, there's quantum activity happening. Fascinating to know. Uh, Non-local spiritual healings or distant healings have been verified. Extrasensory perception has been well studied and certainly can be explained through non-local energies. And Claude Swanson, that MIT physicist, did a lot of work about torsion fields being linked to um, extra states of consciousness and extrasensory perception. So all is one. I think we have enough science about that too. Not only the NDE, what I keep calling that 360 degree kind of consciousness, you know, I was me on the drop and everything all at the same time, or, you know, hey, I can feel all perspectives and feelings and feel it all simultaneously. We can't do that on earth, but now we're realizing through maybe holographic theory how that might be possible. Um, we talked about how uh, David Bohm was the theorist who first decided that, you know what, the universe is actually a hologram when I start seeing what it looks like. And Carl Pribram is a um, psychiatrist who started really talking to David Bohm, and he, he came to conclude that the brain itself and memory itself is a hologram and that our memory does not reside in any speck of our brain. It's not in the matter of the brain, it's actually stored in the frequency domain. And that actually explains a lot of things we see, how people can lose parts of their brain and still have consciousness. It's stored non-locally in the frequency domain. Uh, a man named Anurban Badiopadwe, uh has done a lot of research to verify uh, these theories, and he was the one who found out that we really do have these quantum activity going on within the microtubules. And he basically said, it's like we're clocks within clocks within clocks, kind of speaking about all these rhythms and frequencies at the basis of our bodies. In the environmental science world, we see that. We just see systems within systems within systems. When you look at soil, it's just a bunch of life within life. And they have come to realize even an aspen grove is really just one organism. And certainly we've talked about quantum physics. You know, they went from energy to matter to it's all energy and now it's all consciousness. And, and many of them saying, you know what, there really are no particles. And anything we call a particle, they're noticing, they've called it in, uh, entangled particles, but also they're talking about entangled time and even entangled space. All of that is fascinating to verify how we are all one. So all is alive and conscious. Yep, even now the Carnegie Institution, this was an interesting article in 2009 in the Boston Globe entitled The Blurry Line Between Life and Non-Life. And it's fascinating to know that even they are saying that the dividing line between life and non-life is blurrier than ever believed. That the minerals and chemicals are constantly interacting with living things in very unexpected ways. That the origins of life, you can only understand it as it's shaped by its larger environment, the sphere which contains it. And that even the non-living environment, supposedly non-living, it's like, but wait a minute, you can only understand it in the context of all the organisms that are interfacing and shaping it right back. So evolution is this constant co-evolution process and even noticing that minerals evolve just as surely as living organisms. So boy, did that help me verify my sixth grade download because in that sixth grade download, I was told all is alive, all is conscious in its own way, no matter how small, no matter a tiny little atom or a rock, it's all alive. And I've come to see, verify that even the nothingness of space itself just might be alive. So 
what you see here is a black hole, but notice you don't see the black hole, you see the effects of the black hole on the hot gases that are swirling around it near its border. And it's, it's strong, it has a huge, strong gravity. So when we go into the mystic literature and we hear talked about the absolute or the oneness, the void or the nothingness, the vacuum of space or the field of potentiality, like you're hearing all these different terms, but I believe they're pointing to the same thing. It just depends on, are we experiencing it from the alpha side of things or the omega side of things? Are we experiencing it through a spiritual lens or a scientific lens? Now, the interesting thing about this supposedly empty space, um, each speck or particle they now realize is made of about 99.9999% space. I mean, that is fascinating. And um, imagine that a speck of dust in a sunbeam is the amount of matter, but a huge cathedral is the amount of space. And then when you go look and see what that speck of dust is made out of, it too is made only of a speck of space, a speck of matter to a cathedral ratio of space. And even um, Neil deGrasse Tyson talked about that in his series on cosmos. And then when you look at this space, it turns out that there's more power in the space. Uh, a physicist named uh, Nassim Haramein found out that in less than a proton volume of space, okay, that's pretty small, in less than a proton volume of space, there is more energy than in all the material known universe. Wow. And then William Bray, that physicist who had over 30 medically documented deaths, he calculated that in one fifth teaspoon of space had the energy of 10 trillion, trillion, trillion universes. That's mind blowing. So if even nothing is something, what constitutes reality? What about our journeys in consciousness and what about dreams? Well, even Max Planck, famous physicist and a quantum physics father said, mind is the matrix of all matter. Wheeler, another famous a uh, quantum physics father said, you know what? Sometimes I actually take seriously the idea that the world is a figment of the imagination. And at other times that there's this world out there existing independently of us. But I kind of believe Leibniz who said, the world may be a phantasm and existence may be merely a dream. Montague Ullman, a psychiatrist said, dreaming is the wave counterpart to the particulate notions of space. And I love that because that's how I had always felt. Carl Pribram, the neuroscience that I told you about, memory is distributed non-locally throughout the spectral domain, that frequency domain. So when we go back to my original question, when I wondered, well, how does energy and consciousness interact with the matter and body? What we realize is, you know what, we might have to revise that question especially when we realize that the quantum non-local realm is entangled and one with the localized or particulate realm, which itself is simply a bundle of energy carrying information which we experience as mind or consciousness. So to me, consciousness and being truly comprise all realities. So when I always felt being and presence in all the space, it is. And no wonder I've come to define consciousness itself as energy carrying information. And underlying all that is reside these amazing fields of potentiality that are differentiated by the information within, which we observe as energy, wave vibration, frequency, and qualia, you know, that subjective nature. So consider that where we go in consciousness is where we are in reality. 
and we are not limited to our body except by our belief that we are. So as a summary, I came up with seven statements that to me are really important for us to consider. We really do need more research on spiritual transformative experiences at large in their diverse nature, not just in the ease, since the whole subjective inner nature is now known to manifest all objective form. Number two, as we increase coherence, remember that laser-like, as we increase coherence of our love, which is really collective consciousness itself and really the power of the soul, we increase our power to co-create. Number three, there really is research support for the messages received in our experiences about oneness, light, and love. And essentially it's about being a holographic all that is. Number four, nothingness really reflects a frequency mismatch of the perceiver. Number five, there is more power in empty space than in all material known universe. Number six, we are made of that power, that 99.9999% space energy, that unmanifest potentiality, and it is ready to manifest through the power of our love. And number seven, as most of you have heard in your own NDEs, we are here for the purpose of love. And as we cohere with the highest, most collective love, it's the only way to healing mind, emotions, body, our planet, and spirit. And of course, I cannot help but to end with more of a law of attraction because everybody's fascinated about law of attraction and there's a lot of things being talked about it today. But essentially, consider that law of attraction is a law of love. It's the law of collective consciousness, which is the soul, and it attracts for its higher purposes. And when we become coherent with this love, we increase our power to co-create. And I will be so eager to gain in a discussion.